ways. I'm going to go, if I can, with the help of the Lord into the Word of God here. And we'll start. And we'll start here in the Word of God. I want to go, if I can, in the book of 1 Corinthians. Turn your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 4. Or chapter 3, I'm sorry. Chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 4, 3, 7. The Bible says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives increase. But now listen to this, though. Some people say, well, you know, we ain't nothing. We don't do this. God does it all. Now listen to what he said. Now he that planteth and he that waters are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Amen? Don't forget that part right there. For we are labor together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. That's what Paul laid as the foundation of Christ and a hope in him. Amen? But when we get saved, we we got a foundation to build on. That foundation is Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, that's the things that will remain. Wood, hay, or stubble, those are things that will burn. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. I pray that you help me, God, to teach this in a way to help somebody understand, God, to realize and understand that we will receive rewards someday. We'll get on here, but God will get on there. Help us, Lord, to realize we're working. God, we're working down here. Lord, I pray not only to build a house, but God, to build a house in heaven that endures forever. And God, that house is going to look like one. Of, it's going to look like what we build. Lord, if it's a shack or if it's a mansion, God, it's up to us what we want to build. To Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know what? If you go around and you look around this county and you look at different places, you'll you'll find different arrays of houses and things and trailers. And and I see people now living in them little old buildings that they build and pull on a trailer now. And listen, ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm just trying to help you help you realize something here. There's three-story mansions that's six, seven hundred thousand dollar homes. Then you got people living in, in, in a place that probably ain't worth five hundred bucks. Different types of houses. But in God's kingdom, listen, you can live in the house that you want to live in. According to what you want to live in, you can live in the house that God has for you. You know what? You can live in a three-story mansion spiritually. If you'll just simply do what God says, you know what he'll do? It's not materialism. If we can get our mind off of materialism and off of money, I know we got to have it. And I know and understand that God gives some people more than he does others. But if we can get away from that and look at the spiritual side of it and help us realize one thing, that we're working for the spiritual house and not the fleshly house. Listen, this house you're looking at is going to go away someday. But I'm building a house in heaven that's going to endure forever. And what kind of a house am I building in heaven? I'm building it now. You're going to get to heaven one day and you're going to walk down the street and you know what God's going to say to some of us? You're going to look at all these beautiful houses and all these beautiful mansions and, and you're going to think, man, how pretty they are and all this and that. And then you're going to look around and you're still going to walk down the street and you're waiting on Jesus to show you where yours is at. And you get down there and you're, you've got a little one-story house over here that looks like, it don't look like something, it looks like something maybe a kid would build. And I thought, well, God, he said, this is your mansion. This is what you built when you was down in, when you was on earth and I was and I was trying to build your house down there. He said, you build it. I know that God's got mansions in heaven, but what, what's your mansion going to look like? You're working on it right now. Turn your Bible over here, if you will, to the book of Matthew. Turn your Bible over here, if you will, into the book of Matthew, by the help of the Lord. I got several on Matthew Mark. I need to find which one I need here. Maybe it ain't Matthew. I'm sorry. It's in the book of Luke. It's in the book of Luke, chapter 6. Turn your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 6. And what the Lord said. This is, these were, as Brother Melvin Sisson said, this is in red. 
and 622, Blessed are you when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. This is what he said when he Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. <laughs> Amen. Leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Verse 35. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall be given into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all, it shall be measured unto you again. I've learned this the hard way. But whatever you measure, people, and whatever's in your heart to give, and whatever's in your heart to, to do, God will reward you according to that. He may not reward you financially. You may give financially, but God may not reward you financially. Because, listen to me, I'm going to ask you a question in here. How many of you have ever come into a church service and man, God, and the, or you've been driving down the road, or you've been somewhere else in another church, or you've been somewhere, man, the Spirit of God just overwhelmed you, took over, and you could not contain what was in you, and you had to do something. You had to shout, you had to stand up and testify, you had to start preaching, or whatever it may be, whatever your calling, whatever your gifts is, whatever it was. And like I said, Sister Mona, start dancing and everything else, but you got to do something. But let me ask you a question. Would you trade that or would you rather have $100 or would you rather have that? Amen. I'm just telling you, you ask yourself a question. Which would you rather have, the manifestation of the Spirit of God in your life or money? Because I'm going to tell you something right now. God will reward you according to what labor you put into it. And God's going to reward you, he said, because great is your reward in heaven. You realize one thing. What you do down here is going to dictate what your reward is up there. And great is your reward in heaven if you will endure this persecution, if you'll do good to people that hate you, if you'll do good to people that despise you, cuss you out, say all manner of evil against you, go out here and trash you, run you down like you're dirt, and you still do good to them. And listen to me, not listen, not just uh, just what people see, but I'm talking about when you do things when nobody even knows you've done it. I'm talking about when it's just between you and God. Turn your Bible over, if you will, into the book of uh, Matthew chapter 6 in verse, in verse 1. He said, Take heed that you do not your own before men to be seen to them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Listen, when you do things, you're not doing it to be seen to God. I've done that before. And you know what? I never received one reward for it. I never got anything from God and listened to me. And I, and I gave a lot of money before and not received one reward for it. Why? Because it just doesn't be seen in man. You say, why do you know that? Because I was put to the test and I failed. So, listen, I ain't got time to go into all that, but I'm just telling you right now. There was someone started to take glory for something one time that I was doing, and I opened my big mouth and stepped up, and you know what? And everything, every bit of my rewards and every bit of my blessings was raised. Why? Because God tried my heart. And he said, Tommy, I thought you was going to do this, or, and, and you want to just do this and just to get rewards from me. He said, but you know the bottom line is, though you didn't do it just for me, he said, you wanted some glory out of that too. And he said, I'm not sharing my glory with another. So you know, I've learned the hard way about all these scriptures I'm, that I'm teaching you here this morning. I've done it both ways. I've done things that nobody ever knows what I did. And there's other times it wasn't like that. Amen. I've got weak just like you have at times. He said, verse 2, Therefore when thou doest thine own, do not sound a trumpet before these hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have a reward. You know what it is when you do something to be seen to people and they brag on you and say, man, you know, he's a good guy. You know what? He helped me out when I was down and out. He done this and he done that. And, and if you've done that for that reason, for you to get glory of that, you know what? That's the only reward you're going to get out of it. Amen. It's a praise from that guy. Whoever it was that praised you for that, that's the only thing you're going to get out of it. You ain't getting one from God because he said, I'm not sharing my glory with nobody else. And listen, I understand that there's times that you can't help but do certain things and people's probably going to know who done that. There's times that you can't help it. But God knows your heart. He knows the intent of it and the reason why you done it the way you did. I'm going to ask you a question. God wants you to give some money to somebody and God puts it on your heart. I know because he done me this way before. He, he put on my heart, he said, he said, you get an envelope, put their name on the front of that, put the money in the envelope, go to, stick it in the mailbox at the, mail, at, at the post office. 
And when they get that in the mail, they ain't going to know who done that. They ain't going to know who sent them that cash because, you know, you got it wrapped up in a piece of paper. Nobody knows there's any money. But when they get that, they're like, well, I wonder who sent that. Well, would you not pray and asking God to help you? And so all of a sudden, something comes in the mail, money, and nobody knows who it was. God will get all the glory out of that because that's the only one that they could ever attribute to giving it to them because nobody else knew. Are you getting where I'm going with this? Yeah. you got to realize one thing. Everything you do has to be, in, it has to be that God will get all the glory out of it. Amen? I'm just telling you. But listen, but when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Amen? He said, and thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. God will reward you, and, and he'll be openly, and everybody will see God's reward he put upon your life. But they don't understand why that got ticks. They don't understand why God does this and why God does that. They don't understand why some people come to church and they get to do this and get to do that and, and other people don't get to do anything. Listen, this is one of the reasons why. It ain't all the reasons, but one of the reasons. He said that thy alms may be in secret and thy father is sitting in secret himself shall reward thee openly. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Really, I say to you, they have a reward. I've been in church before when uh, when people out pray the preacher. I don't care how long you stay on the altar and pray. And, and I've done this, and I'm telling you, and I remember being in church one time, and the pastor of the church, he just had a, he just had a, a burden for a lot of people that time, and he prayed, and there was this other guy beside of him. He was praying also, and I knew this guy. He always has to out pray everybody in the church. And, uh, and I seen that, and that preacher kept praying and praying, and, and this other guy over here, he was, he was digging and scratching and clawing for anything he'd get to pray about. And I just sat there, and I'm telling you, I was listening to this praying going on in my spirit, and I was laughing in my spirit. It wasn't really funny, but I was thinking, man, if you only knew how silly you sounded, you shut your mouth and go back to your pew and let the preacher finish his prayer. But he didn't. Finally, that pastor got through, and he, he ended his prayer, and that other guy, then he just wound down. And I'm thinking, man, you know what? All you do is just like a big old goo sticking his head up over a log just to get you a good look at him. Well, I mean, turkey. Goose, turkey talk. <laughs> anyway, anyway, he said in verse 5, or in verse 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou shut thy door, pray thy father which, sits in, which is in secret, and thy father which sits in secret shall reward thee openly. Don't do it. God knows your heart. And listen, when you're up here and you're praying, there's nothing wrong with that. And sometimes, you know, you lead prayer. People, you lead the prayer or whatever. And David asked people sometimes to lead us in prayer. And we're downstairs. He said, lead us in prayer. You know, it's not, the, it's not to be seen. But sometimes, you know, you just lead in prayer. But don't do it to be seen. God knows your heart. And don't pray some big fancy prayer or do this and that and try to do this or that. Just pray what God puts on your heart. When I got down to praying here a while ago, listen, I didn't pray for a lot of things y'all requested because I can't remember all of them. But you just pray as what comes to your mind. And when you get in the closet and it's just you and God out by yourself, there's a lot of things you pray. There's a lot of things I don't pray out loud because of being offensive to people. I remember one time David come to a, to a, uh, he come to a hospital room and there was a person dying there in the hospital room and all kinds of people in there, they probably... 15 people gathered up in the hospital room. And he came up there to see that individual. And I thought, well, you know, we'll just do whatever we need to do here. But then, this is what David said. He said, if all of you will, he said, let's just have a moment of silence. And I was like, a moment of silence? This person's dying. This family needs prayer. But I realized and understood the reason why. He said, let's have a moment of silence. You know why? Because he couldn't pray out loud. What the Spirit would give him over to pray. Because he would offend half the people in that family. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you the bottom line. There's some things you don't need to do. And then, you know what God told Jeremiah? He said, don't you pray for this people. He said, I ain't going to hear you pray. He said, I've done judge them. He said, don't you pray for them. There's some people you can't pray for. How many of you ever got down and you really, you prayed for people, but yet there was just no connection to heaven? You really never made much of a prayer for them. You know why? Because you don't. You there was no prayer to pray. 
I'm just telling you one thing right now that no prayer to pray. Listen, but I'm going to stay focused here this morning on the rewards that God's given us, and not only here, but to come. How many of you in here are working? How many of you in here have some type of retirement plan? You're working. Hey, there ain't nothing wrong with Shane does. These two ladies do. People have a retirement plan. Tom, I ain't got nothing. <laughs> but it ain't because that God didn't want me to have a retirement plan. It's not that God maybe didn't want, didn't want you to have one. But I prayed about that at one time. And, and God just didn't want me to go that route. But what I'm trying to ask you is this. What are you looking forward to? Golden years? <laughs> you're living them. Right. I'm just telling you right now, you're living golden years. But I understand when you get older, I'm telling you, I'm getting feeble. I didn't realize it. I'm telling you right now, you see me hollering out here this morning, ain't because I got hurt. It's because my Achilles tendon is attached to my heel back there. It's killing me. But you know what? It's because you're getting older. And somewhere down the road, you're hoping you'll get Social Security or retirement and you get it all laid up. But what about spiritually what you're working for? Not because you get old and feeble and because you want to spend your best days. Listen to me, your best days is to come. I guarantee you that. But it ain't going to be old and feeble days. It ain't going to be golden years. It's going to be everlasting life. And you're going to have an, you're going to have an everlasting kingdom that you're going to be living in that's going to last forever. And you're working toward that, and you're laying up retirement for that. You're you're putting rewards back for that day against that day. <clears throat> if you got a retirement plan, am I wrong? You have to give some portion of your money now toward that retirement plan. If it's four hundred one k or if it's whatever, and your your place of business will match that, and they'll put in retirement for you. And some places just give you retirement, and you don't have to put anything in there. Is that what yours is? But some you do, and some people are telling them 401k is not a good thing because I'm telling you right now it ain't a good thing. Retirement's not a guaranteed thing if you put it back. But this is the thing why I'm telling you. These, this retirement I'm telling you about is a guaranteed thing. I can promise you one thing. When you get to heaven, you won't lose your reward. Turn your Bibles on over here if you will into the Word of God and what He said in the Word. This is also in red too. He said in Matthew chapter uh, 11... Chapter 11, verse 40. Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, it's chapter 10, verse 40. 10, verse 40. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And listen to what he said in 42. And whosoever should give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of the disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. God's saying right here that you will not ever lose that reward that you gained down here, that you laid up in heaven. But he's trying to, he's trying to help people understand in these scriptures right here that no matter how small of, a, of what you did to somebody, you will not lose a reward for that. Some people think, well, a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Listen to me. I am not going to receive a reward according to my call. I'm not going to get rewards in heaven because I've been called to preach. You're not going to get uh, a rewards in heaven just because God gave you eternal life. Just because he gave you the gift of eternal life. You're not going to receive a reward just for that. You're going to receive rewards for what you did with your calling and what you did with the life God gave you down here. That's how you get rewards. Listen, eternal life was a gift that God gave to you. You didn't do anything to receive that. You've never done no work. There'll be no reward for that when you get heaven. The only reward is eternal life itself. And when I get to heaven, I'll receive no reward because it's a preacher. I'll receive no rewards for no matter what my position was in the church. You won't get no rewards for that. The only rewards you're going to get is for the work that you've done in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be tried by far of whether it was done because of you or because you've done it in the name of the Lord. And, and listen, the far is going to try it. What's the far? The Spirit of God. Amen. If your reward remains, it's because it was gold, silver, precious stones. But if, you're, but if it burns, it was wood, hay, and stubble. It's because it's built upon you and not built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. You better realize something. 
There's a lot of things I've done in this church through the years that I won't receive one thing for one day when I get to heaven. Why? Because I've never done it in the name of the Lord. There's things that I did because people asked me to do it. I drove all the way to Lexington before to make a visit to somebody and never get one reward out of that and won't get one in heaven either. Why? Because I never prayed about it and was led through the Spirit of God, but I went because that person asked me to and I didn't want to hurt their feelings and I wanted praise from them. Just the way it is. I'm just being honest with you. A lot of people don't want to be honest and say, well, no, everything I do is for the Lord. Well, I say the same thing too. When I went to Lexington up there to visit some people, like, I'm, hey, the Lord sent me up here. And I come here in the name of the Lord. It don't matter. God knows if he's one sent you or not. You understand Amen. what I'm saying? I prayed about what to do with Brother David up there when God began to burn my heart with this. Listen, I didn't do this arbitrarily. I prayed about it and prayed about it until I got a concise direction on that and what God wanted me to do. Listen, all I was was just obedient to what God wanted me to do. That's it. But you know what? I'll receive a reward for that someday. I may see it here. If you see Dave walk through that door and come back up here in this pulpit again, you know what you can say? Say, I just did what God asked me to do. Am, am, am I the reason why did he do that? No, am I? Listen, God's the one that does that. He said, he that plants and he that water are one. But he said, listen, only God can give the increase. But he said, you'll receive a reward for the labor you put into it. And if you pray for 30 minutes every day, like you said you just want to do for Brother David, and whatever God does in his life, then you that labor that you put into that, you'll receive a reward for that someday. Amen. For what you've done. That's what God's trying to help you understand here this morning. There's rewards for what you do. Listen, what you do don't go unnoticed. And you say, well, I do this in the closet. I do this. Nobody ever knows I've ever done that. I gave a lot of my income and stuff to this work or that work and nobody even knows what I've done with that. God does. Amen. And if you don't get a reward here and if you and people don't see that and know that, listen to me, what does that matter? Because he said, if, if people know you've done it, he said, then you've got your reward. But he said, I'll reward you openly. God will reward you here too. But he'll also reward you there. You understand that? How many of you in here has got an earnest of the spirit? How many of you got a down payment? Remember I preached here the other day? God gave you his spirit and put it inside of you. Well, one day he's going to give you the purchase possession. And Jesus is going to come yeah. back. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to fill you with his spirit. He ain't going to give you just a little taste of it every once in a while. You're going to be filled with it 24-7, which ain't going to be no such thing in heaven because there's no time in heaven. But listen, what you're doing now, and you say, well, I'm this age, that age, I probably ain't got many years left on me. Whatever time you've got left, you better be you better be laying up a, a, a retirement. Amen. You better be laying up. You know what you better be doing? You better be putting some two before in that house when you get to heaven. How many of you want to get up there and you want to be embarrassed because your house is a little old bitty house over here and this little old lady in the church, you didn't think ever done much of anything and, and you thought, man, you've done all this for God and you preached here and preached there and done all these different things and about 95% of it was all about you and what about God and this little old lady in church you think, you know, that didn't do much of anything. She's got a three-story man. You look at that man, I like to have that one. And then you see, and then you realize that that little old lady that was in your church or that little old lady that you was acquainted with down here, that's her mansion. And then you have to, you're looking up at hers and then when you see yours, you have to do this. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, you get rewarded according to the labor you put in it. And whether you've done it in the name of the Lord or in your name. Because I ain't getting no rewards for what I've done in my name. I'm just telling you one thing right now. How many of you in here, be honest with you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you in here, you give money to people? And you know, if you're kind of poor like I am, when you give money to people, you know, it, it, you, I don't want to sit here and scrape a beer off of eight giving it to them, but the one thing, it's harder for me to give somebody $100 than it is for some guy, you know, it's rolling a six-digit figure of income every year. But you give, but how many of you in here be honest with it, and you and you've given money to people, but you really you think the part of you deep down inside of it, you really want to be seen doing that. And if you were seen doing that and that, you know what you you won't get a reward for that what you just did. You won't do it. And you know what? And you pray for people. And how many people's done this? You know what you need to do? I seen this happen in this church one time. 
There was a man come here deep in sin. Now I'm telling you, he was a lost guy, and everybody knew it. But he promised somebody to come to church with him, and I never knew this. You know why? Because I've been, I've been drunk in the altar. Amen? And I never do this. I mean, I talk to people before. Don't get me wrong. you got to do what God asks you to do. But you better not be doing it because you want them to be saved under your watch. You don't want them to be saved while you're preaching. You don't want them to be saved while whatever. But you need to just do it according to the will of God. But I saw this guy in this church. And he's already kind of like stool pigeon, you know, standing here. He kind of stood out like sore thumb in the church. And when, and when it come down to the end of service and, and, the, and the altar call, these people was already going to this guy. And I'm like, man. Because I knew why this guy was here. And I'm just telling you right now. I never go to people and say, why don't you come to church? Promise me you'll come to church with me something. I never have told a lost person ever that. Because you know why? That person needs to come to church when God brings them here. When yeah. God leaves them here. Listen to me. They may come here when you drove them here because you made them promise you they'd come with you sometime and they sat there on a the pew and God ain't even dealing with them and the sermon's preached and it offends them and they say, I'll tell you one thing right now. I'll never be back that blank and blank church again. And you know what? I never saw that man ever got the doors of church after that. He never came back. And as far as I know, that man died lost. That's why you can't. You offend people. What you've got to do is do this. Come to church with me sometime. I, I, I might. Okay. Don't make, don't make no promises and say you'll come to a certain time or anything like that because I'm telling you right now. I've seen this happen. People out of their own self want him. Come to all. I see him shake his head and I thought, man, you, better, you need to leave him alone. But what do you do? You're right in the middle of a church service. These people no longer here, but I knew they was doing that within themselves. Why? Because they wanted him to come and pray and be saved. And they would, they would be crawling around this church like a big bang rooster. I've seen that happen too. You better realize and understand one thing. God's the one who gives the increase. Amen. This preacher, no other preacher, and no other Christian in this church or any other church will ever save anybody on an altar. You may sit here and leave them to God. And I remember her little niece back here took me over a year and a half to get in with her. She would hold her head down. She wouldn't look at nobody. She wouldn't say nothing to anybody. And she would not give nobody nothing. But I began to start going back and sitting down beside her. And she was drawing. And I'd tell her. And you said, well, people should draw in church. Listen to me. She lost. And she had some issues. And I looked at her picture and I said, you're a really good artist. I said, what did you learn to draw like that? And I said, I said, you know, I used to draw when I was in school. And I got, my mom kept my, my, uh, Papers that I did, all the pictures I draw when I was in school. She gave them back to me when she died. But I said, I used to draw a lot. And uh, I got, and she never would talk to me, and it took a long time. But after a while, she would look up at me and she'd smile. And after a while, she started talking to me. Listen to me right now, I'm just telling you one thing. But I had to be, I had to use the wisdom of God with her because I'm going to tell you something, I can't save her. I can do this and do that, but I can't save her. She came to the altar and prayed several times. But one night she came up here and prayed. And I did not know what to say to her. And she was struggling. She wanted to be saved. But she did not. She was just, there was just saying, hold her back. This was how simple that it was about that girl getting saved. God said, you tell her to say her prayer out loud. And he, that's all he told me to tell her. And, and she'd been up here for a while. And I, I bent down and I told her, and I said, Alexis, I said, you pray. But I said, when you pray, I said, pray out loud. And say, Lord, I know that you've forgiven me. And I know because your word says, if I ask you, that you will forgive me. And when she said that out loud, she got saved. And you said, well, how simple is that? You listen to me right now. I plant and I water, but only God can give an inquiry. Only God can give you wisdom of what to say to an individual because you don't know. You don't know what's hanging that individual up from being saved. You don't know that. You have to let God do that. And you know what? But I've seen so many times people get in the way of that. And I'll be honest with you. There have been times that I, I, I've gotten in the way of people in times past. And just, I wanted to see them saved and I do things. Listen to me. Everyone I've seen here have. I have and you have at times. Because, you know what? When I was a young Christian, I did that quite often. Until I learned 
Amen. But listen, we all have to learn. But this is the bottom line. God will overshadow all those things. But he's trying to help you realize one thing. No matter what you do, no matter how small it is, only God can give an increase, but you won't lose your reward for that. If you give one of these fruit baskets out right here to somebody this Christmas because God burned your heart to give them one, then listen, you've done all you can do. You planted your water, but only God can use that to work upon that person's heart. You understand, like David said, it may take years for you giving these to people or going and talking to them before you ever get a witness with them to ever get them saved or ever have a, a place where God will draw them to be saved. You realize that God has to draw people to be saved? You give this basket to somebody, God may not be drawing them to be saved at that time, but you're planting a seed in their heart. You're developing a friendship. It took me a year and a half with that girl every service going back there and sitting beside her before I could talk to her. But you know what I gained? I gained that girl's confidence. And I'm the only person in this church that can talk to her. Why? Because I took a year and a half of my time every service that she was here to go and talk to her. It takes a lot of time. I'm going to deliver baskets to people. Some of them I ain't ever delivered to before. But it just takes your time. That's all it is your time. Your time is more precious than money. Your time is the most precious thing you've got. How many of you in here ain't got enough time in the day? How many of you in here ain't got enough time in the day to do things you like to do? Most of us. That's the most important thing you've got is your time. That's what I tell people. So you can do it. I said, yeah. Yeah, I can get an extra job and I can make some more money. I can buy my kids more toys. Do they need any more? No, they don't. They got too many now. How many, how many presents have you bought for your kids this year? A goose egg. You said, you mean you ain't bought your kids no Christmas presents? Well, my wife has put my name on her with her. But I bought my kids one thing. Why? I told my wife, I said, I'm looking at all these things these kids are getting, and they've been holding presents for two weeks. Shame on them. <laughs> but anyways, they got all kinds of things. So what are you going to do? I ain't spoiling them worse. I never got nothing. And then I'll come home sometime, and, and I'll buy my kids something, and my wife said, well, what'd you do with that? I said, because they needed it. Or I said, because it's on the heart, I wanted to give it to them. Listen to me, I don't just give them things during Christmas. I don't give my I don't just give my wife flowers on Valentine's Day because I never have. Ever give you flowers on Valentine's Day? I ain't never give her about flowers on Valentine's Day. Listen, that's my condition, but this is what I'm telling you. But I have given her flowers throughout the year and I haven't been in a while. But this is what I'm telling you. You need to do things while it's on your heart and mind. You need to do it when God's putting on your heart. When you pass the flower shop and God says, Go back, go back and get your wife a flower. Then you go back and get your wife a flower. When God's telling you to go visit somebody, then go visit them people. That's the only time that you'll make a difference because that's the only time you're doing it in the name of Jesus. I've made visits to Lexington Knoxville all over the country for nothing because I wasn't doing it in the name of the Lord. I went there and said I was doing it in the name of the Lord because to be honest with you, that was what's in my heart. I thank God, well, I'm doing this, you know, because of you. And he said, well, I ain't sending you. I'm just telling you, I'm trying to help you, not waste your time. Now, you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to help you not waste your time. Turn your Bible over here, if you will, into the Word of God. Let me find the next place I need to go to. I want to read this other part. This is another version of that in the book of Mark. He said, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he falls not us. And we forbade him because he falls not us. This is what he, but Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can like to speak evil me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, merely I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Amen. Listen, how many times because people didn't do everything the way you thought they should do them, you just brushed them off or you just told them they, they don't, can't do this and can't do that. Listen, whoever's for you is not against you. And they'll receive a reward just like you will. You know the Baptists don't believe that the Pentecostals are going to heaven? There's Baptists like that that don't believe the Pentecostals are going to heaven. But did you know that the Pentecostals don't believe the Baptists are going to heaven? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, somebody asked me one time, and one preacher was kind of in particular swayed that way, and he said, well, I don't, I don't see it this way and that way. And I said, listen, brother. I said, I've got people that's Pentecostal brothers. 
Yeah. And I've got church of God, brothers, that's, been, that's the church of God. And I said, I know they're saved because they see the fruit in their life. I said, they don't believe the way me and you believe. And I said, it don't mean they ain't saved. And it don't mean that people don't get saved under them. You understand what I'm saying? But Jesus told him, he said, listen, whoever's for us can't be against us. And he said, there's no man can cast out a devil or do a miracle in my name that can slightly speak evil of me. You better realize and understand one thing. We're not all seeing eye to eye, but this is what I'm going to tell you. If you're saved, you'll receive reward if you've done the name of the Lord. And God knows the heart. Amen. There'll be Pentecostal, Church of God, Presbyterians, Baptists, and all kinds of people that get to heaven. But when you get to heaven, we're all going to be one. There'll be no such thing as a Baptist. There'll be no such thing as a Presbyterian and a, and a Pentecostal and the Church of God. There won't be none of that up there. It'll be pure religion and undefiled. <laughs> like James said, before the Lord. And it's going to be pure religion and undefiled. Turn your Bibles over here, if you will, in the book of Hebrews. And this is where this is where it all comes down to. This right here is where it all comes down to, these rewards and what I've been teaching about here this morning. This is what it all boils down to. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Most of you in here know it by heart. He said, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you don't believe that God will reward you for what work you do, you'll never do nothing. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you in here would work for a paycheck? Or how many of you go to work before you go to work at if you know they went on paycheck at the end of the a week on Friday? How many of you just love to go to work? They wouldn't none of you be at work. Because you work for that reward. You work for that money. How many of you in here lay retirement back and you know they weren't going to be there when you need it? Would you do it? You wouldn't do that, would you? Well, I mean, Shane back there, it don't matter to him, he ain't got nothing in it anyway. But the bottom line is, what if you was paying in half up and they was paying in the other half? Would you waste your money putting it in there if you know you were never going to use it? No, you wouldn't. That's why you won't do nothing for God if you don't believe God's going to reward you. There was a man, he's, 70, he's going to wait he's 75 years old, retired. You know why? I think he's going to I'm telling you, I looked at him. You know what I said? I was wanting to ask him so bad one day. I thought, Tom, how long do you think you're going to live? When you get 75, how many years you got left? I'm telling you right now, most people's in wheelchairs and walkers and in nursing homes by that age. And here he is, what, he's 75. And you know how much money he said he needed? He said, man, he's at least, at least, Wayne, he's talking to my boss. He said, Wayne, man, needs at least a couple million dollars to be really safe. And I thought, it ain't going to take you five years. Or he, I said, it'll take you longer than five years to spend two million dollars. I said, that's about all you'll live out You're tired and flat. You may not make it 75. But listen to me. That's how foolish people become and how that Satan's got people so blinded to things. A reward that they're never going to get. How long are you going to wait till you draw Social Security? At the deadline. When they tell me that I'm going to be able to draw Social Security, Brandon, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to the Social Security office. Well, you go, well, I might work too. Besides that, I don't know, but I'm telling you right now, I'm going to mine now. I don't want to wait till I'm 75. I want mine now. I don't care if I draw $500 more a month. What's that to me if I'm in the grave? And listen, I'm just telling you. That's why I prayed, and I said, God, what do you want me to do? He said, don't do it. Because I, I mean, listen to me, I had a lot of, I, I had a few kids. And I was working at the sports sack, and I was bringing home probably about, probably at that time, less than 400 bucks a week. Every penny I had was was important. And they asked me this and asked me that. They said, how many dependents you want to put down on your, on your, uh, on your, you know, for your taxes? How many dependents you want to put down? I started going, six. And they said, six? What do you want to put a six down for? I said, well, that's how many I got. And they said, yeah, I know, but you you won't get as much back at the end of the year. I said, look at me. I got I got five kids and a wife. I said, do you think I need to end a year now? I said, I need it now. I said, yeah, I know it's probably only about 40 more bucks a week, but I said $40 a week is quite a bit when you ain't making 400 hardly anyway. That's a lot. So I told them, I said, no, I don't want to do that. <clears throat> and people just could not understand that. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I probably may not live long enough to enjoy retirement. 
God knows. That's why you need to pray and ask God and say, God, what do you want me to do? I don't know what you need to do. And listen, I just threw that in there because God put them on my heart. Because I got to believe that God will reward me or I'm not going to do much work for him. Amen. I'm just not going to do it. And if I don't believe that God's going to reward me for the, for the things that I'm doing right now, then why would I do it? I know, I know I'm kind of like the same persuasion Brother David is in one way. He said, even if I knew there wasn't a heaven, he said, I'd still serve the Lord because it's a good way. And it is. But I know I got flesh. And I'm sitting here letting all this in my flesh and watching all this stuff pass me up and all these things that people are doing. And listen, there's pleasure in sin for a season. But if I knew there wasn't no heaven or anything after this life and after I die, I'm just poof, man. I'm like the Jehovah's Witness. Say, You're just dust. And you ain't never coming back. I'm going to tell you something. I doubt I'll do for God. Because if you think about it, what would be the point in it, really? Right. It's a good life. I understand God give you a good life down here. But, if, but when you're in this flesh and your flesh is thinking, man, this is it after I die, then your flesh, I'm going to tell you one thing right now, I don't know if I'd live for God. I'd probably live it for everything I could get out of it. I'd suck every bit of the sin out of the sin bottle like David used to preach and I could get out of it probably. Because there's no reward after I die. But you see, I know better than that. You know what pushes you forward as a Christian a lot of times? It's because you know the Word of God is true. You know that God will be with you, but you also know one thing. God will reward you for doing Amen. good. But you know what God also do when you do bad? There's something called chastising. How many of you like getting whipped from God? There's a fear of God. But Amen. not only a fear, but a faith to believe that God will reward you for doing good. I'm just telling you right now, for doing good, or you wouldn't do anything for God if you didn't believe that. He said right here in Revelation 22, 12, and behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. To give every man according to his works will be. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He said, I will give every man according as his work shall be. Every one of us is building a house. <clears throat> like I've said, and I keep reiterating, you're building a house. Paul said, take heed how you build on this foundation. Listen to me. The gates of hell has never prevailed against my foundation of my house. When I got saved, Jesus Christ, I laid a foundation of Jesus Christ. And Satan has beat against my house ever since I've been a Christian, but my house has never failed because it's, it's built upon a solid rock foundation. Jesus Christ, faith in him. Listen to me. But what that house looks like is up to me. Like I said, a three-story mansion or just a, just a mediocre, plain old Jane house. It's whatever you want. Do you want just a plain old Jane house? Ah, that's all right for me. Listen, so I told my I told my family, I said, if it was just me, I'd live in a camper. I said, I wouldn't need anything more than that. But I said, you know why? Because it's all I would need. Now, you know, I'm just a mediocre type of guy. I mean, I don't need nothing fancy or nancy or anything else. But when you get to heaven, I believe you're going to want more than just that. And while you're living here, I think you want to build a better house than that. Don't you want something that'll shine? Don't you want something that'll please God? Don't you want to build a house that, that other people can look at and emulate? You know what? How many, I know you women in here is worse than men on, you know, certain things. Not worse, but I mean, you just have a different look at things. Men don't really care about certain things. Well, some do. I'm not getting into that. But my wife can decorate our house the way she wants to decorate it. I mean, to me, I mean, no, I, I get on to her sometimes because every time I come in, the couch is in a different corner. And I said, what did you do that for? And she said, well, I just kind of got tired looking at it that way. You know, I understand that. That's women. You know, they like things different. Men, I mean, I don't care. Just throw it over in the corner and leave there for 25 years. It don't matter to me. The same picture hanging in the same cockeyed position for 20 years. I mean, it don't matter to me. But, you know, but I understand women do. And you know what? When it comes to building a spiritual house, I think we all need to take notice and think, man, I, I like to have a nice house. And don't get me wrong, I do like it that way. I like them scented candles. You know like him? I told my wife, I buy scented candles, and I'm going to work the women going to the candles. <laughs> because I like candles. I like scented candles. And, and my wife, and I told her, I said, there's just certain ones I like, and I like them in the house. But you know what? It just brings a different mood. How many of you ever went in places that, that just had certain smells or just certain atmosphere, and you just felt kind of like at home? Yeah, you can look at Jason where yeah, yeah. He knows what I'm talking about. He's honest about it, but he knows. I talked to a guy at work one time. He said, yeah, he said, that is. He said, man, that's true, ain't it? And I said, yeah, it is, because I was honest with him. He never heard anybody say that before. 
Remember something. Everything you do is building a house and a reward. And when you get to heaven, I want to look, I, I want to say, God, I've done everything I could and I've done my best and I, I said, I want to see that mansion. And I don't want to sit here and look at a mediocre house. He said, well, Tommy, that's the kind of life you live. He said, you just kind of laid back and you didn't do it. And listen, I have been. Listen, I failed God as much as anybody in this church. But you know what? I don't want to stay there. I want to, I want to get up and start building a house. How many of you ever seen people take 10 years to build a home? Why have you ever seen that? Take people 10 years to build a house? Just stick a little bit here and there every once in a while and you know, do this a little bit and do this a little bit. Mike Spradley spent 12 years building his house. He did. He spent 12 years building his house. Put a little here and a little there and doing that. But you know what you're doing at Mike's house now? It's three stories high. He's got all. He's got these nice handrails and banisters and, and, and oak and oak floors and everything. And I'm telling you, he's got a nice house. But it took him 12 years to build it. Put a little bit in time. Did it take you, how long did it take you to build your house, Tony? Okay, he's still working on his. Amen, brother. Still working on mine too. But you know what I'm telling you? But Mike's got a nice house now. But it took him 12 years to build it. You're putting a little bit and a little bit and a little bit into it. But someday you're going to have a finished product when you get to heaven. But if you don't believe that God rewards you when you get there, He won't do much for you. Amen. If you don't have faith to believe He'll reward you here or there, He won't do much for God. He